Good to see everybody. Welcome to the, the new year, the new academic year, back to the school. I'm David Brown, for those of you who don't know me or forgot about me over the summer. I'm the Executive Vice President of Governance Solutions and co-founder of the Professional Director Program. And joining me today is my colleague, Rob DeRoy. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to September. I know I had I had someone going off to their second year of high school this morning, so it's an exciting, exciting, exciting time for, for the kids. I don't know if it's as exciting for us, though this seems like it might be the first week of summer with the weather we're getting. Uh, everything's in reverse. So anyway, we're looking forward to today's uh, program, and uh, I'll kick it off with, back to David. Great. Thanks, Rob. And as Tala said, these sessions are recorded for archive purposes for people who want to go back and uh, have a look at them at their leisure. So um, just to give you a heads up and the uh, chat function, Rob will keep an eye on the chat function while I'm going through the content for the session. And if it seems appropriate to tell me to pause and we'll have a Q&A during the session, that'll be great. And there's certainly time scheduled at the end of the half hour for people to ask any questions or make any comments that they have. All right, well, let me share my screen and let's get going. So this session is about leveling up. I, I guess leveling up is something that comes from the world of video games. And so how can you level up the five levels of financial literacy explained and so one of the reasons we're talking about this session today and our last session that we did uh, two weeks ago was on the MDNA is that our two next education series both have to do with building financial literacy and financial capacity around the boardroom table. So we thought it would be helpful to kind of get people thinking about that and and uh, and to um, share some of the some of the core learnings going into going into the fall. So the big idea, the first big idea, uh, is uh, maybe a little revolutionary. I don't know, and that is that financial literacy is not a binary thing. Often, when we're approached with financial literacy, and I know sometimes regulators can be accused of this is that they view it as a binary thing. Either you are financially literate or you're not. Presumably you're financially illiterate. Um, but instead, like all types of literacy, whether it's uh, reading and writing or arithmetic or technology, it's not binary at all. It's a journey. It's a, it's a continuum that everybody is at a particular place on. And so that's the first big idea is, is is wrapping our head around the notion that financial literacy is not binary, it's a continuum. And that leads to the other big ideas. So uh, the second big idea is while the highest level of financial literacy, what we call level five, what's called financial expert, uh, is not something you can learn after you become a board member. Uh, that requires a lifetime of continuous practice and learning both uh, your education and your uh, professional pr practice is how you build to a level five. All four of the other levels can be learned through professional development and audit committee training sessions and going to audit committees and learning by doing. And, and so that's the second big idea is that you're not locked into whatever level of financial literacy you happen to find yourself on on day one when you get appointed or elected to a board. You've got an opportunity to raise that ceiling up to at least as high as a level four. And then the level of understanding, the level of financial literacy that you need is highly dependent on the organization itself. No, no two organizations have exactly the same uh, need 
for a, a mix of financial literacy expertise. And so one of the things we'll do in today's session is unpack some of the drivers and share with you a couple of examples from different types of organizations to get you thinking about, about uh, what level of financial literacy and mix I need, uh, I ought to have around my boardroom table and my audit committee table. And then that leads to the other big ideas. And the other big idea is that every board ought to, on an annual basis, when you're updating your board skills profile, you ought to be taking a look around the table and setting your desired levels of financial literacy. How many people of the different levels of financial literacy would you like to see around the boardroom table as a whole? And audit committee, how many people of what levels of financial literacy, what mix do you feel that you need around the audit committee table? And as I say, that's something that every board ought to do every year when you're refreshing your board skills profile. And that's gonna require a dialogue between your audit committee and your governance nominating committee, because usually the governance nominating committee is responsible for the board skills matrix or profile, whereas the audit committee is more keenly aware of the needs and the drivers for financial literacy. And then the, the final big idea is you as an individual. And I guess this leads into also our, our training programs, our education programs coming up this fall. You as an individual should firstly be uh, aware of what level of financial literacy you're currently at. So we have a financial assessment tool that you can use for that that we'll post later in the session. Uh, and then ask yourself the question, what level of financial literacy should I aspire to be and over what period of time? And therefore, what are the courses and programs and things that I ought to do in order to achieve my personal target of financial literacy? And obviously these two things go together. You've got 11 people on the board, the 11 individuals are going to have individual aspirations of leveling up and the uh, the collective group of 11 uh, give you that level of financial capacity in the board. So this is a conversation. Uh, and, and even though levels of financial literacy are potentially sensitive, um, at the end of the day, if you want to be a good fiduciary and act in the best interest of the corporation, you do want to be fairly transparent, at least with your fellow board members, as to where you are on the spectrum and 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 where you can realistically expect to uh, be a year down the road. All right, so let's unpack some of the content. So the definition of financial literacy in Canada, at least, the authoritative source is the Canadian Securities Administrator's uh, National Instrument 52110. So this was published originally in 2003. It was a response to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act being adopted by the United States Congress in the summer of 2002. And so in reaction to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which includes in it requirements around financial literacy and financial expertise, the 13 different provincial and territorial securities administrators and commissions in Canada got together and firstly, they took over responsibility for corporate governance uh, uh, guidelines and enforcement uh, in Canada. They took that away from the stock exchanges, which had essentially been self-regulating up until that point in corporate governance. And then they put together a series of national instruments, which collectively uh, represent the Canadian version of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. They're in seven or eight or nine different documents, which in, in a way is unnecessarily complicated. But when you're looking at audit committees and anything to do with audit committees and independence and financial literacy, your source is CSA 52110. And the definition of financial literacy there, it's a little complicated, but uh, let me just go through it. It's the ability to read and understand a set of financial in statements that present a depth and level of complexity of accounting issues 
that are generally comparable to the depth and level of complexity of the issues that can reasonably expected to be raised by the company's financial statements. Don't want to pick on lawyers, but it feels like a lawyer wrote that. Anyway, the, the good news is that uh, it's about reading and understanding financials, and it varies depending the amount of it that you require does vary depending on the complexity of your, your own organization. So that's good. I think it recognizes to some extent this notion that it's not binary that financial literacy is a spectrum. So here's the five levels. Now these come from us at GSI. These are not from CSA. These are not from, from someone else, some, some governing body. These are levels that we developed at Governance Solutions as a tool, as an assessment tool to help people uh, understand uh, their level of financial literacy. And so level one is, is the beginning. Uh, I have a knowledge of mathematics that I learned in school, but I, I couldn't tell you the difference between a debit and credit. When I look at a balance sheet or an income statement, I couldn't even really tell you the difference between them. That's level one, uh, novice, you'd call it. And then level two is more of a beginner, a learning level. So I, I do know the difference between a, a statement of financial position, what used to be called a balance sheet, and a statement of operations, an income statement. And if they're fairly straightforward, I, I can understand them. I know the difference between assets and liabilities. I, I know about net worth or net assets. And I know about profit and loss and the difference between revenues and expenses. I, I have a, a kind of basic understanding of, of accrual accounting in terms of time periods. So that's, that's level two. And I, I would say most people in most boards are at level two or, or higher. Uh, and then level three, we would call competent. The word adequate, of course, is, is totally dependent on, on what your needs are. But this is a little bit more. I, I not only understand the basic financial statements, but I can also get a pretty good understanding when I read the notes to the financial statements. I also have a pretty good sense of the cash flow statement, cash being used or um, generated by operations, by investments, and by financing, and how the three kind of balance and fit together and flow. And the MDNA, which we talked about two weeks ago, the, the management discussion and analysis narrative. I can read that and have a, a bit of a good understanding of placing the financials in, in a historical and forward-looking context, and also the main risks uh, that the organization faces. So we would call that level three or, or a competent financial literacy, moderate level, whatever word you want to use. And level four is, is proficient. This is significantly higher than levels two and three. This is someone who has a good understanding of the assumptions behind the financial statements. I understand uh, about... Uh, business judgment and management's estimates and fair value accounting and the different ways that fair value is applied to assets and liabilities. And I also understand about discounted net present value. Uh, and therefore I understand about pension accounting and about, about uh, how, the, how the level three in the fair value hierarchy is uh, level two in the fair value hierarchy is calculated. So that's that's a much deeper understanding of financial uh, statements. And we would call that level four proficient. It's probably as high as you can strive to be without being a professional accountant. And that's what level five is. Level five is an expert. It's somebody with a designation. It's somebody who has spent their life in accounting, either as a CPA or as a CFO, they have a thorough or an auditor, thorough understanding of both generally accepted accounting principles and, and even auditing standards. They, 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 they have the capacity to uh, not only read, but the capacity, if necessary, to uh, prepare financial statements. That would set aside a level five. And so broadly speaking, that's the hierarchy, the five different levels of financial literacy. Now, 
one of the things that has complicated life in the last few years uh, and has in fact raised the bar in financial literacy is the changing accounting standards. And this cartoon is meant to illustrate back in 2011 when Canada was debating whether we would uh, uh, adopt the international financial reporting standards out of Europe and the and 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 uh, and uh, the, basically the rest of the world other than the United States and and so the situation is there's 14 different competing standards that that number is just in the cartoon and somebody goes well we need to develop a universal standard that covers everybody yeah we do and then as soon as you introduce the, the new uh standard you now feel like you have more you have 15 competing standards instead of getting rid of the 14 you had before so if that's how you feel or how you felt uh with the adoption of ifrs in canada you're not alone uh, we now have at least four major different accounting standard systems in Canada. We have IFRS, which is for publicly accountable entities, and those standards are set internationally. We have ASPE for private enterprises, which is a simplified form of uh, IFRS set by the Canadian standards. We have accounting for not-for-profits, and we have accounting for public sector and then we also have pension plan accounting. And, and, and so you've got these at least five different ways of producing financial statements uh, post-2011. So I think it's fair to say that does raise the bar when it comes to financial literacy. And arguably, it makes it much more difficult for anybody to claim to be a level five, to claim to be a financial expert, to be a financial expert I, I would say, and this is just me sort of thinking out loud, you could be a financial expert in any one of these. You're not likely to be a financial expert in all of them, though. That would take a, a great deal of dedication to stay up to date in them all. Maybe, maybe you would be. If you're a partner in an auditing firm, then you need to be up to date on all five. Uh, but the vast majority of people would probably specialize in one or two of these. And so... One of the things that firstly you ask yourself is what's your financial literacy level in this particular set of accounting standards? Because you might go from the board of a of a uh, of a publicly traded company to the board of a not for profit, and people think, of course, you're going to be financially literate because you just came from the board of this publicly traded company, and instead you got to relearn financial literacy because there's a whole new set of accounting standards. All of this to say it's something to take in, into account when you're having that annual discussion around your boardroom table about needs. You want to think about, well, what set of accounting standards do we follow? And that's one of the templates that you're going to use to evaluate the financial literacy of people coming in. So the main driver of how many people of different levels you need around your audit and uh, board table are the mandates. What are the roles and responsibilities of the board and the audit committee? And then how do those vary in terms of, of breadth and complexity of your particular organization? So the board's role is to approve the financial statements. And I, I don't want to gloss over that because at the end of the day, even though the financial statements are prepared by management and they're audited by auditors, and they're reviewed in depth and, and recommended by the audit committee. At the end of the day, it's the board as a whole that approves the financial statements. And, and to me, that requires a certain level of financial literacy on the board as a whole. Uh, so that you're not just blindly relying on the recommendation of these three other parties, management, auditor, and audit committee. Also, it's your job to appoint and oversee the audit committee. So you need to understand financial literacy well enough to make sure you're getting capable people on your audit committee. You receive the auditor's report directly, and so you ought to be able to ask informed questions. And ultimately, you're accountable as the board to the shareholders. So those are, those are the kind of main financial literacy uh, needs for the board as a whole. And then, of course, the audit committee, you're reviewing and recommending the financials, you're reviewing controls, 
you're dealing with the auditor, hiring them, uh, agreeing on their engagement and their scope, getting into the nitty gritty of the work they're going to do, and even who's going to do that work and how much we're going to pay for that work. You also deal with internal audit. If you have that in your organization, you make sure there's a, a safe disclosure process. So definitely around the audit committee table, this is not a place you should be learning financial literacy. Uh, you ought to have a reasonable level of financial literacy among every single member of the audit committee in order to fulfill uh, these responsibilities in, in an effective way. Now, one of the decisions you face in Canada is, do you need a financial expert on your board and on your audit committee? Someone who's a level five. And effectively, the difference is, I said it verbally already, but here it is in writing, a level five person has the ability to prepare a set of financial statements of equivalent complexity. And so, and so the question is, do you need to have a financial expert on your audit committee? Every board would love one, but there's a limited number of them available in Canada, which is one reason why when the Canadian Securities Administrators approved the National Instrument 52110, they made financial expert optional in Canada. Whereas in Sarbanes-Oxley Act, it's mandatory that if you're a publicly traded company, you must have at least one financial expert on your board. Typically, if they be your on your audit committee, and the tradition is they're usually the audit committee chair, although that's not personally something I'm a fan of, but to stay from going on rabbit trails. The, the, the key thing is in Canada, this is optional. So it's a discussion you wanna have at that same meeting every year where you look at your board skills matrix, do we need a financial expert? Do we need more than one? And then the other question is, how realistic is it for us to attract someone who is a financial expert? So depending on the size of your organization, the compensation you're able to offer, because charities can't pay directors, uh, it's against the law. So so people are serving because they're, they want to give back, they, they want to serve. And so can I attract someone who's a financial expert uh, without any remuneration in that case? So it's a discussion about both need and about the ability to fill that need. And the good news is the regulators recognize that, uh, recognize that there's not an unlimited pool in Canada, and therefore you are going to want to uh, take a look at how pressing a need it is for you to recruit a financial expert. So what are the drivers of higher levels of financial literacy? Well, first of all, you look at who are the users of your financials? Do you have shareholders? Are you a publicly traded company? If you are, if you have shareholders, then you've opened yourself up to significantly higher obligations and that's going to press up the level of financial literacy needed. What about debt? If you have a lot of debt, then you've got obligations to creditors and that pushes up the level of financial literacy you need around your board and audit committee. How about regulation? Are you a credit union? Are you an electricity distributor? If you're subject to uh, regulation uh, of some complexity, that increases your obligations to regulators and the public. That increase, increases the level of complexity, pushes up financial literacy. How about audit? If you don't have an external auditor, if you have accountant prepared financials and you don't have an internal audit function, then you're losing these legs of the audit stool and everything is reliant now on your audit committee and, and, your, and your management to uh, be responsible for financial statements. So in some smaller organizations where you don't have an audit, you actually have a higher need for financial literacy on the audit committee because you don't have all those other people you can fall back on uh, to give you professional advice. Do you have a complicated corporate structure? Do you have complicated financials? Do you have subsidiaries and affiliates? Do you have a lot of different types of, uh, of transactions? Do you have a lot of fair value accounting? Do you have a lot of estimates and judgments? Do you have a lot of business risks that are difficult to mitigate? Have you had a history of financial challenges? 
Uh, do you have some environmental sensitivity and exposure to environmental risk? And then I thought I would just uh, have you think about, and I guess we'll do this at the end, but I want you to be reflecting in, in the Q&A time shortly if there's any other drivers you can think of of financial literacy. So we're almost done. I do want to share a couple of samples. So, so I, I think you may find it helpful. And there's a huge caution here. These are just samples. So don't just pick them up and paste them and say David Brown or Governance Solutions said to do this. These are just benchmarks to get you thinking. If you're a larger for-profit corporation, you may want to have every one of your board members at minimum level three after uh, one year of service and maybe a third of your board members level four or five. Maybe that would be enough. Audit committee, everybody ought to be level four after one year and maybe two members level five. And the reason there's two is if you were to lose one all of a sudden, you have a backup, a, a spare, if you will. And then medium size not-for-profit. What might be a reasonable expectation? Well, maybe around the boardroom table, all board members would need to be level two after one year and a majority of them level three or higher. And that's certainly my sense is it would be very difficult to be a fully contributing board member in any sector unless you're at a level three. And then audit committee, everybody ought to be a level three, striving for a level four. And if you can, uh, it would be nice to have one level five, an expert if you, if you can. So the big takeaway here is this is a continuum. You can move up the continuum. The board and the audit committee ought to make a decision every year as to the, the aspired level and mix of financial literacy that's unique to your organization based on where you are in terms of strategy, risk, complexity, and each individual around the table should be setting a personal target. 